Ahoy ye mateys! Stephanie here on my private tier. In this video, I'm going to cover some of the best gear options for the private tier class in early 2019. The reason I said early 2019 is because there's rumors that there will be a level cap increase later in the year. We don't know when that's going to happen, but we did see in the developer's notes for the previous test realm update that there is a level 75 Hercules, so they seem to be working on some sort of update. But in the meantime, the information in this video is going to stay current for at least this PvP season and possibly the next one. So Privateer is the support class, and it is a will-based class, which means that our highest stat is will. Now because we don't naturally learn any attacks from our class trainer, we have to pick a weapon type and from many people's experience the most effective playstyles for this class are either melee or staffy. I have heard of people trying shooty but I just don't think it works that well. Feel free to share your experiences though if you play shooty privateer and you have had success with that. So a general all-rounded melee privateer set would look something like this. The hat would be the Corrupted Warlord's headgear from the Tower of Mu Manchu. This gives a Valor's Fortress and a Revive. The fact that we can have both a fort and a revive on just one piece of equipment gives us a resource advantage over the other classes. Most classes can only have either a fort or a revive, but not both. Another hat option is the English Bill's Obsidian Hat, which gives three copies of this card called Jobu's Kiss. This is a 9 square range drain 3x3 three three area, and it can be extremely helpful against summons or against melee units who cluster around you. It can be a major tempo changer if timed right, but in general the Corrupted Warlord's headgear is better if you don't know who you're facing. So for the robe, there are lots of different options. This one is the most popular choice just because Privateer lacks attacks and it's really helpful if the opponent manages to take out all of your companions for you to be able to finish the fight with an assassin strike. This is also helpful if you want to support your companions in taking down a key unit early in the game. Now, besides the Imperator's Panoply, which is dropped by Discilos in Aquila and a bunch of other bosses, there are some other options for increasing our damage output. One option is the Beretta Bendolier, which is dropped by Kane in the final dungeon in the game. What this does is it gives you a First Mate's Boon card, so you can give your weapon power to a really strong damage unit like um, like Goronado, or Nausicaa, or Egg Shen, and these units will basically have really powerful hits, a lot more weapon power than they normally have for 3 turns, and that amount of power will enable you to take out 1 or 2 key units early in the game. So First Mate's Boon is a really good card if you get an opportunity to play it in early game. However, if you do not manage to use this card and you're stuck in late game and all your companions are dead, then that's why people tend to prefer Imperator's Panoply just because it's more flexible and you don't have to have other units alive to be able to use it. Also, Hold the Line is really good for preventing enemy units from getting past your pirate to your more vulnerable units behind you. So it's really nice to have at least one rank of hold the line. If you manage to get three ranks of hold the line, then you can actually decrease the dodge of approaching enemy units, which is also a really good strategy for some builds. So continuing with the melee attack options, the Arms of Saint Fido is a robe that is dropped in Marleybone and it gives a vicious charge card. Basically, what this does is it allows you to move at twice your movement range and decrease the accuracy of the target. So you can use this in a variety of ways. If you are fighting a ranged opponent like Musketeer or Witch Doctor, it can be really helpful to charge a great distance and 
decrease the accuracy of one of those ranged units. You can also use this card to support your swashbuckler companions. So if you are using, for example, Contessa, who has this ability called Repost, or if you're using Toro, who also has Repost, if you can decrease the accuracy of a melee unit like a Buccaneer or a Swashbuckler, it allows your Swashbuckler companions to get Repost reaction hits on the target. So Vicious Charge is another really nice card that is useful in a variety of situations. Then for a more defensive playstyle, you could try the Lord Admiral's kit. I have also tried using this. This is really good, especially if you find yourself facing a lot of opponents with early rush strategies like swashbucklers who fog really early and who have an all-out aggressive team. If you stack Leviathan's Call with your Valor's Fortress, then that will prevent your pirate from being easily killed by four units focusing on you. But you do have to be aware that if you go with a shield stacking strategy, some opponents will have a card called Purge Magic. It is available on the companion Old Scratch, but it is also available as an item card on a necklace called Sprocket Key, and Witch Doctors learn this card naturally. So what this does is it removes all buffs, all shields, you know, all accuracy buffs, whatever buffs in a 3x3 three three area. So if you do go with a shield stacking strategy, be sure to stay outside of purge range. Alright, so continuing on with the equipment choices, this is probably the best pair of boots you can get. It is also dropped from the Tower of Mu Manchu. It gives a Valor's Fortress and the big guns. So the big guns are really good for controlling your opponent's movement in early game. So swashbucklers will probably want to bunch together in a square in order to use Black Fog. If you cast big guns, you can restrict their movement range that way. If you don't have the Corrupted Warlord's Boots or you want an alternative, the Warbird's Wraps, which is dropped in Cool Ranch is another option. It gives you an extra copy of Valor's armor. I have tried using this. It can be really nice if you want to have two armors in play on the battle board or if you want to survive a swashbuckler poison combo. But in general, the Corrupted Warlord's boots are better. So for the pet, for a melee privateer, you're definitely gonna want Grant's Relentless. So you can chain a little bit, especially off your repel borders. And then after that, it's based on personal preference. So for a more defensive playstyle, you would want to increase your ranks of repel borders and elusive. Basically what this does is, let me show you. So you learn two ranks of repel borders naturally from the privateer trainer. Rank 3 repel borders decreases the accuracy of incoming enemy units by 50%. Now for elusive, you learn 3 ranks naturally from a privateer trainer, you get increased 50% dodge and increased 2 movement range when your health is below half. When you bump up the rank to rank 4, you get 75% dodge under half health. So it's really nice to have a pet that grants elusive and repel borders for a defensive playstyle. Now for an offensive playstyle, you might want a pet with a uh, turn the tide. This will give you increased weapon power under half health, which will sometimes help you to close off matches. And if you can get a pet that grants blade storm, this will also increase your chaining abilities uh, for late game. So for an offensive playstyle that is aimed at, you know, finishing off the opponent with your own hits, you would want abilities like Grant's Bladestorm, Turn the Tide, and then for a defensive playstyle, you're gonna want Repel Borders and Elusive. In terms of power grants, there are some that are helpful. So Brutal Charge, again, for the same reasons that I suggested the Arms of St. Fido. Soul Reaver is a really nice distance attack. There are some other grants that are helpful, like Kraken's Lament, which can be stacked with Valor's Fortress. 
to defend against early rushes. Triton Song, weaker version of Kraken's Lament. Cloud Spirit, if you're using agility based units, this will increase their chances of getting criticals. If you have a pet that grants this card called Backstab, it can also be really helpful. There are tons and tons of pet abilities in this game and just infinite possible combinations. This just happens to be one combination that has worked for me, but I am working on a bunch of others as you can see. Oh, I should mention also, if you have a pet that has this ability called Sent 2, that is also really helpful, especially against swashbucklers, but it also is helpful against any opponent who uses hides, because this ability makes it so that hidden units will no longer be hidden if they approach your pet, or if your pet approaches them, and this can disrupt certain rush combos. So this is also another really good ability to have. Alright, so moving on to the weapon. This is probably the most popular free-to-play choice for melee privateer because this weapon gives a haywire strike and a surge of technomancy. Now the surge of technomancy is a distance attack with a range of 5 that will damage the target and remove the earliest buff. So if you see that they only have a Valor's Fortress on, you can basically use this to instantly remove their Valor's Fortress instead of having to wait it out. You can also use this to remove a Valor's Armor. Or a First Mate's Boon if you're fighting another Privateer, it really depends. But that purge is very very helpful. And the Haywire Strike is nice for having an extra guaranteed hit because again, Privateer base stats are really bad, we will miss a lot if you rely on basic hits, and generally we don't really hit unless we have guaranteed hits. We spend most of our turns supporting our companions. Now another free to play option is the Bound Oni's Bulwark. This is dropped from the Tower of Mumenchu. This will increase your pirate's rank of Hold the Line by one rank and will also increase your base armor and base magic resistance. So for Hold the Line, rank 1 stops 1 enemy, rank 2 stops up to 3 enemies, and rank 3 will actually decrease the dodge of incoming enemy units. So rank 3 can be really really helpful if you can get it for a defensive playstyle. Now for paid options for melee privateer, there's the Gargoyle Shield, which Again, gives a rank of hold the line and has better weapon power than the Bound Oni's Bulwark. However, it does not give as much, you know, magic resistance. So, this one is just like an alternative to the Bound Oni's Bulwark. Cossack's Blades gives one rank of Relentless, which is really nice if you did not spend your practice points on training Relentless, which I will show you in a second. So if you want to get rank 2 Relentless, this weapon can help you to achieve that. Continuing with the paid options, Grizzled Veteran's Shield grants one rank of Turn the Tide. You can also consider the Raiding Tackle, which gives a Team Absorb, but do keep in mind that this weapon is strength based. Moving on to the accessory, Death's Bargain is probably the best one because this means that when your health goes below 50%, every time a unit attacks you, if they're adjacent to you, you will drain health from them. So you'll basically be like a vampire. So this is really helpful for a tanky defensive playstyle for late game, where your main goal is to exhaust the enemy resources and just gradually wear their health down while staying alive so that you can finish off with a big hit. However, it does require some calculation to use properly because if you accidentally let your health drop too low, you might die, and if you keep your health too high, then the Soul Shroud wouldn't trigger. There's also a bunch of ways to bypass this, like if they use distance attacks on you, your Soul Shroud wouldn't trigger. So this is my personal favorite to use, but there are a bunch of other options. 
Technometer's glasses is for a more fast-paced playstyle. This removes all debuffs in a 3x3 area around your pirate, so you can use this in a variety of ways. For example, if you carry two copies of First Mate Spoon, let's say you're using this one and this one, what you can do is you can give weapon power to one unit and then use the spell magic to remove the debuff and then boon another companions. So you have two companions with first mate's boon on the board and that's a huge threat. Other ways you can use this are if you're facing opponents who rely on debuffs, so like witch doctors who have spell power debuffs, or buccaneers who have accuracy debuffs, you know, any sort of debuffs, you can instantly remove them with this card instead of having to wait them out and just keep up the pressure that way. Finally, this card is helpful for disrupting combo plays by swashbucklers. So if they cast Assassin Shroud on you and they want to restrict your healing for 5 turns while they try to finish killing your pirate, you can instantly remove the curse and heal off the damage. So those are a bunch of ways you can use Dispel Magic. Another thing that's nice about this accessory is it increases your will, which increases your chances of getting critical heals, critical guns, critical hits. Another accessory that's really nice for a fast-paced playstyle is the Eye Guard of Deflection. This is dropped from Sato in Mushu. And basically, it gives you a Leviathan's Call, it also gives you some health. So you can stack this with Valor's Fortress to defend against early rushes. You can also use this to save a copy of Valor's Fortress for late game. So it basically increases your survivability in early game, but if you're the kind of person who plays at a slower pace, Death's Bargain is definitely better. Eye Patch of Blind Fury can be really nice if you're using the companion Old Scratch. It gives you a Mojo Storm, which is a 9 square attack, instantaneous, and that can actually wipe out an entire army of Scorpion Summons sometimes, or like it can be a huge damage threat. But it does have a limited range, so if you want more offenses, Another option would be the Eye Patch of Palace Wrath, dropped by Xena in Aquila, which gives a Mourn Song. The Patch of Forceful Smiting is dropped by Siba and gives a Big Guns. Now moving on to the totems, this one is the best all-around one, especially for melee privateer, it gives a fort and revive. However, the Simply Smashing Monocle, which gives a Vicious Charge, is another option. And the Kanushi's Beacon, which gives an Assassin Strike, is an option as well. For the Necklace, you can go with Capitano Chain, which is dropped from the final dungeon. You can also, if you want more offensive options for your pirate, go with a Special Branch Ribbon. This is dropped by Tyler in Marleybone, gives you an Assassin Strike. Or you can go for Amulet of Zeus, which gives a Mojo Storm. Finally, the right hand strand dropped from the Tower of Moom and Chu is always a nice, well rounded option. Gives you a heal and the big guns. Now, for the ring, you can go with a Brain Thief ring from the Tower of Moom and Chu, which gives a fort and big guns. Or you can go with a Capitano ring dropped by Kane, which increases base will and gives a first mate spoon. Ring of Tartarus dropped by Xena is an option as well. So now all of these equipment pieces are for a melee playstyle. If you are not using a melee weapon, there are a bunch of other possibilities. So the Doctor Nose tunic can be used if you have a melee weapon, but it can also be used if you are using a staffy weapon. What this does is it gives you a Mourn Song. The Mourn Song does less damage than Assassin Strike, however, it does go through Leviathan's Call, Kraken's Lament, you know, all those melee shields. It can be really powerful in early game or in late game if you've run them out of their Valor's Fortresses. Great Chief's Robes is an option for timing out 
a black fog or a walk in darkness for defensive purposes. You can also use this card offensively by doubling the amount of weapon power you can give to a companion using your first mate's boon. Finally, there is also the Mumenchu Robe, Corrupted Warlord's Oyoroi, which gives a revive and a big audience. Oh, and I just want to mention really quickly that Captain Blood's jacket is really good for PvE, but this card, Blood Flames, is banned from PvP, so if you go into PvP wearing this, you will just never draw Blood Flames because you can't use that card in PvP. So that's something to keep in mind if you have never tried PvP before. Definitely want to get your hands on one of these other robe options. Now for a staffy playstyle, the go-to weapon is Nefarious Staff, which allows you to summon 9 scorpions. For a PvE, you're gonna want to use a weapon like Fool's Wand, which gives you a very very long range and allows you to cast, you know, revives at a really long range, but I wouldn't recommend this wand for PvP. Go-to wand for PvP would be the Nefarious Staff. And if you're using the Scorpion Summons, you are gonna want either the Grizzled Heart Banner, which increases weapon power and critical rating, or the Swashbuckler Banner, which increases their agility and therefore their criticals and their dodge. Okay, so for setting up your skill points, I'm gonna use this calculator on the final bastion and I'm gonna put a link in the description. I'm gonna start with the abilities that I think are crucial for PvP regardless of playstyle, and those would be Walk in Shadows, which costs 2 points from the Swashbuckler Trainer, and Fast 2. What Walk in Shadows will allow you to do is hide either to time out an enemy hide or to double your weapon power for first mate spoon or for assassin strike. Fast rank 2 increases your movement range by 2 squares. This can be extremely helpful for running away from an opponent or running to make sure you can reach a key unit. Spooky rank 2 from Witch Doctor is also very important because privateers rely heavily on spells, so Spooky boosts your spell power and allows you to have bigger heals and bigger damage from big guns. Now from here, you have a bunch of options. For a defensive playstyle, you're gonna want Raise Barricade from Musketeer. This will allow you to block off squares to defend against early Black Fog rushes or against Buccaneer Charges. Another thing that investing points into Musketeer will allow you to do is you can also train a Wind Spirit which can help you to boost the agility of your agility-based companions like your Musketeers and Swashbucklers. Now if you don't choose to invest points into Musketeer, what you could do is invest points into Buccaneer Talents, which will allow you to get a rank of Relentless. So if I click this, it automatically selects the prerequisites that are required to get Relentless. As you can see, Relentless costs a total of 5 points. This is why some people choose to use Cossack's Blades for Relentless instead of spending this huge amount of points to get it. Now, Witch Hunter you can get after getting Spooky 2. This is really helpful for facing opponents that use a Soul Shroud tanking strategy, and it's also really helpful against Witch opponents. So if you choose to go this path without the barricades, you have 3 points left over, you can do a bunch of things with that. You can go Mighty Charge, um, which allows you to have a long range guaranteed hit. And then two more points, either I would go with Kraken's Coils and Triton's Song. Kraken's Coils will allow you to boost the damage of your Buccaneer units like Goronado or Egg Shen. Triton's Song gives you a stackable melee shield. Or you could go with just Mighty Charge and um, Ghost Wheel, which is a long range guaranteed magical attack and Mojo Strike. So there is a bunch of options. This is how I've currently spent my 21 points. I have Mighty Charge, Walk in Shadows Fast 2, 
Whim Spirit Barricade, Ghost Whale Mojo Strike, Spooky 2, and Witch Hunter. And I only have one rank of Relentless from my pet, and I put on the Cossex Blades for when I want a second rank of Relentless. So as you can see, there are tons and tons of gear options for a privateer. I tried to be as comprehensive as I could, but I'm sure I'm missing something. The best way to figure out how to play a privateer is really just to try it yourself, observe some other people, and yeah, develop your own playstyle. One of the reasons I find this game a lot more interesting than Wizard 101 is because there's just such a variety of gear options and playstyles. You can't really copy someone's playstyle and win as consistently as they can because there are just so many ways to play. So leave a like if you enjoyed this video, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.